Greetings! Welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. We have a couple of troughs. These are the troughs that we burnt out in the uh, previous video. Um, this one is the one that was closest to the camera. This is the one that was farthest away from the camera, just in case you're curious about how the particular ones turned out. And today's objective is to get these cleaned up and ready to dry. Um, we're not going to do, we're, we're going to get them cleaned up, we're going to get them pretty smooth. We're not going to do the absolute final finishing cuts that will be the final finished surface. And I'm still not going to level the top, so I'm going to leave this char intact for now. This will get leveled out and flattened, um, but that's not something I want to do until they are all the way dry and all of the warping and checking and shifting and twisting is finished, right? Because I, I did leave these ends fairly meaty here so that I have plenty to work with, but I still don't want to take off, take that down to final dimension and then have them twist. And this log did have a little bit of propeller twist in it, so that's, uh, you know, bears watching, that some of that could you know, if I shave it down right now, some of that twist could reemerge in the final dry. Right? Now, as they dry, we have hollowed it out. This greatly reduces checking and splitting. It does not eliminate it. These will check and split. Don't panic about that. Uh, these, I'm going to use these for nobles. So, first off, they don't have to hold water. They have to keep flies out of my raising muffins. That, well, not muffins, that's quick bread. <laughs> that he flies out of my raising donuts or whatever. They don't have to um, hold water. They don't have to float like a boat. So if there's a little bit of checking, I'm okay with that. Also, you will very frequently notice when you're drying a big chunk like this, this happens a lot with my duck decoys that are made out of a solid piece of wood, is it'll be drying and it'll open up this gosh awful quarter inch wide check. And they're like, ah, oh my goodness, that was such a beautiful block of wood, and now it's ruined. And then if you put it away and ignore it for a month or two, as it dries and all the temperature e temp the temperatures and all the moisture is even out, that will shrink back closed, and you'll hardly know it was there. Um, until I carve it, you don't know it's there, right? So if a check opens, don't panic. Let it dry all the way. Most of the time, it'll close again. Now, if you want this to hold water, something this size, if you want this to hold water, you need to put water in it and keep it wet constantly. Mm. In this size of bowl, it will check and crack. Uh, if you look at dugout canoes that were made, this is, a, this is exactly the process of making a dugout canoe, it's just smaller, <laughs> right? Dugout canoes, when, well, that they still are used in many areas of the world, they have to be kept in the water soaking constantly. If you bring them out for a week, they will explode and never be useful as a canoe again. Right? So here in the Northeast, the, the tribes that use dugout canoes as their primary, uh, primary mode of transportation 500 years ago, talking historical context here, all those tribes are still here, but I'm specifically talking about the historical context at the moment. Um, they had canoe places, which were well-known locations where everybody would take their boats, and you could get on a canoe, you would take it to the next canoe place, disembark, and then walk. And then somebody else could come to that canoe place, embark, and take it back to the original. And in the winter, wherever the canoes were, were left, when, it was, when you were right at, at ice up, you would take it, you would take the canoes, you would swamp them, completely fill them with water. They'll still float because they're wood. And then fill them with rocks to sink them to the bottom. They would overwinter underwater. And then in springtime, you'd go, you'd find your boat, you would pick out all the rocks, dump the water out, haul it up on shore, get it nice and dry, surface dry, not, not cooked in the sun dry. You know, pull it out, you know, get all the water out of the inside and dry it out so it's comfortable to boat in, then push it right back in the water and tie it to a tree. <laughs> so it was never out of the water. Right? You bring it out of the water, it'll check. Um, now, small checks, 
like this one, a few of these cracks, it got fairly thin on the ends, on, on the ends here, okay? So I don't know if it's going to show up. There's a couple of dark streaks. There's a dark streak, there's a dark streak, there's a dark streak. Those are some areas where that it, it did kind of crack a little bit through, and as I was washing the inside of this, some of the water leached out, and you can see a little bit of staining from the charcoal. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. So there are a few cracks in here. That's okay. It's a dough bowl. If I can't get through that, I'm fine with it. But if I wanted this to hold water, it would leak for a couple of days. Then it would, then the wood would expand, and it would those cracks would seal right back up again. So this would be totally fine for a watering trough, mm -hmm. right? So you do want to keep those things in mind. Um, you have to expect some checking. If you're making a, a bowl that you want to be like a soup bowl for your kitchen, you have to get the walls extremely thin. Extremely thin. The thinner the walls and the slower the drying, the less likely it is to crack. And, and that size class, you can get the walls so thin that it's not going to crack too bad. Um, but something like this, where, you know, here, you can actually run your hands along it and you can feel the thick and the thin spots fairly accurately, right? So here it's about, probably about an inch, give or take. And here it's probably about two and a half or three, right? Inches of wood right there. So that is definitely going to develop some checks. With the wood that thick, there's no way around it. You get it down to less than a quarter inch. Now you have a chance of, of drying it out totally crack free, assuming there's no pith in it. And that is a big assuming. Um, but I'm okay with that. It just can't be a crack so big a fly gets into my dough. <laughs> right? That's fine. That's my purpose for these bowls. So let's talk about cleaning. How much cleaning do you need to do depends on your purpose. If this is a, if, if I was making this for an SHTF stock trough for putting grain in from a sheep, right, it's done. Actually, for that purpose, it's overdone. I would not have taken all the effort to make a nice shape to it here if I was just going to put sheep food in it, right? So if I was going to do that, it's done. A little bit of ash and charcoal won't hurt it a bit. In fact, it's a uh, traditional form of animal husbandry is feeding charcoal like out of your fireplace or your campfire actual clean charcoal not the charcoal briquettes you buy at a grocery store but feeding char to livestock is a traditional part of old-timey animal husbandry um, it, it helps you know detoxify their guts right so this char wouldn't hurt them a bit if this was a pig trough you're done just quit. Don't waste any more time and energy on it. It's a pig trough. They're going to chew on it. To, you know, uh, ruminants are going to crib on it. You're going to. It's going to get destroyed. It's not going to be here long. Just burn it out and quit. Right. But I want this in my kitchen, so I'm going to do a little bit more work. The first thing is to take again some blunt tool that's not overly sharp, and this is just a uh, pressed sheet metal garden trowel with kind of rounded edges. Right. I can put full force in and run this against my hand and I have no danger of even getting a brush burn. And I'm just going to take the side of it and scrape it. Scrape the loose off. And I'm just going to do this little section for you. You can see we're getting quite a bit of quite a bit of biochar here, right, that's scraping off. This is totally fine in the soil. It will only do good, right? Um, and then get yourself one of these. Yes, I know I'm using a modern tool here. Um, go to the grocery store and get one of these really coarse steel wool scrubbies, okay? And take this and go with the grain and scrub it down until you're through all of the black and you have this nice brown polished surface in here. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
and that'll clean it up really nice. And I love these. They get these little indented cracks, you know, high and low spots, just a really, real old-timey organic shape to them that you cannot replicate with any other method of hollowing this out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very unique. So take this and just kind of scrub down so you get it as clean as you want it for your particular purpose. You won't get into all of these little spots, but you can kind of get your fingernail in there and, you know, scrape them out. No. If you can't get your fingernail in there, nothing else is really going to get in there either. Um, and you know what? If you get a little bit of uh, charcoal, in, if I get a little charcoal in the first low batch or two of bread that we make in these, meh. So what? It's good for me just like the critters. You know, so <laughs> perspective. Don't worry about some of these little things, right? Mm -hmm. Perspective is important. So I'm not going to do all of this on film. I will bore all of you to tears. But that's the process, just a dull scraping tool and one of these really coarse pads. Okay, uh, back to if you're watching this from like a living history museum and you want to do something like this with all traditional tools. What would you use instead of this? And the answer is a rock scraper. Um, or a seashell scraper would work really well for this stage, too. So a slightly sharpened seashell. Now, seashell dust is, is horrible on the lungs. You do not want to inhale it. So if you're working with the shell, um, you could also use a bone scraper. Like a, 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 deer, a cow leg bone would be really good. Just cut it off on end with a 90 degree. And then you can use that for this purpose instead of this. So stone, bone, shell, something like that. And instead of the scrubby, you could go and you could get some um, equisetums, scouring rush, horsetail grass. Go several common names for that. And you could use that for, instead of this. Um, you could also just use like a, a just a, a not too coarse piece of sandstone that was kind of rounded and would go around the curves. You could use that as well. So if you wanted to go full tradish on the tool end, you could use those things. So I'm going to flip both of these over here and show you what we're doing with the outside to clean up the bowl. And if you look at this one, it's chopped. It's, it's kind of crudely rounded, but very crudely rounded. Okay. On this one, it's a nice, even rounded shape. Right. This is the extent of the finishing work that I'm going to do right now. This is done, this is almost done, this is not started. So what are we doing here? We're using lighter tools for finer cuts. Just prop this up here. And I'm going to take the hatchet and I'm going to do this with two hands, partly for control, partly because I got a nasty gash on right on the palm where it hits, so I'm going to use the second hand just to kind of so I'm not battering my cut too bad. Um, but on this fine work, I do like to use two hands on the hatchet just for control. And we're just going to start, and we're going to use this to plane down the outside with light, not too aggressive, smoothing cuts. We're just going to take off all the irregularities. this curve up, right? I've got two or three, I've, I've got a healthy two inches of wood in here on this one as well, right? So I don't have to be worried as I bring this up of cutting into that hollow, right? So I don't want this to be a real sharp curve. I just want it to, I want it to be a real gentle, organic um, kind of curve here. for control. And don't be hasty with it. Do not be greedy with your cuts. You 
you can see the size of the shavings I'm taking in comparison to the size of the shavings I was taking when I was swinging the big heavy axe and really knocking this wood out. Um, when you're down to these finishing cuts, we're not going to be remo removing huge quantities of wood. We're just shaving it down for aesthetics until it looks the way we want it. You can, if you want a little bit more control, just put the palm on here and, and shave like that as well. If you want a little bit more accuracy than swinging it. start going around, you know, all, all the way to where I'm only doing end grain here, I'll often just kind of nick it with the tip, I'll just kind of roll the tip down with the swing, and not try to get in with the whole thing. And like right here, I'm just going to kind of come mostly with the tip, you see I'm just kind of working that back. Very light, very controlled. There's actually Scandinavian styles of hatchets that have a swoop on the end here, specifically for this type of, of axe carving. Right? The um, traditional Norse woodworking, you have a collection of axes and few other tools. And all the finish work is done with axes and adzes. Same with uh, uh, Pacific Northwest Native American wood carving. It's all axes and adzes, plus uh, their version of the crooked knife, um, which is different from the Eastern Octagon. There's adzes that are made for removal. There's adzes that are made for Pacific Northwest. I'm still talking just for texturing your surface. So you can do very good, very clean work with an axe and an adze, as long as you're willing to slow down, take the time, and do it light. So you can see this is finished, this is unfinished. You can see the difference. Now, I think you get the idea on that part. I'm just going to push this aside. Um, on this one, this is all the way done. This one, I... All of the tool marks you see on this end are from that hatchet. Mm. Okay, so this is this is the hatchet work. See, this is about how smooth I can get it with that hatchet. Um, it is on my mind to expand my collection of hatchets. I haven't quite done it yet, but that's okay because there's more than one to do one way to do everything. And the next tool I'm going to bring to bear here on this is the draw knife. So if you can kind of see here, this, if you look right here where I haven't really worked yet, this is, a, the curve is a little asymmetrical, mm -hmm. okay? It's a little sharper on this side and a little gentler on this side. So I just want to kind of even that out a little bit. And I want to bring in these corners so that I have this, the same nice curves that I do down here. And for that, I'm going to go to the draw knife. Now again, I need to expand my collection of draw knives a little bit. This one has handle problems when working mm -hmm. on a piece this big. But I can still get in and do quite a bit of this, evening this out. Again, this is just cosmetic. said if this was an if this was just going to be a utilitarian pig trough or dog bowl it would be really silly to put this much time and effort into cosmetic stuff but also like here I can't get in so when I can't get in anymore I kind of know I have the same slope <laughs> So while it's kind of annoying, it's also sort of a gauge. This wood is still very 
wet on the outside. Okay. This is a lot more symmetrical now. Is it perfectly symmetrical? No. Is it going to be perfectly symmetrical? No. This is um, nostalgic primitive woodworking and I'm not going to cover up all of these tool marks and I'm not going to make it perfectly symmetrical. I want a nice traditional organic form and I want it to look finished but I'm not going to be too OCD with trying to make it look like it was factory made because what's the point, right? Now there's a lot of areas here where I can't get to with the draw knife and that's where a slick or a big chisel comes in. Is this all in frame? Mm -hmm. Love it. Thanks. This is a two inch, um, the two inch uh, firmer's chisel that I handled to use as a slick for a carving like this. And this will now get in and I can take off the high spots very nicely. And it is nice to do this while it's still wet. Get it to its final shape. This is giving a slightly uneven cut texture. I need to spend some more time on the hone this particular tool, but it'll do well enough for this demonstration. And this is where, you know, you have so much power with a two-handed um, two uh, chisel like this because I can pivot on, pivot on the front, plant it, and then um, pull on the back or push on the back. And, you know, because that's the tip swings out and around, you can get a really powerful and at the same time very controlled cut. So this will make pretty quick work out of evening out the rest of those hatchet strikes. And every once in a while you're going to find one where it dug in deep and that'll be a permanent mark and that's okay. You'll see that on old pieces. Those riving splits and hewing marks. Are very common on old pieces. And if you want to embrace traditional hand tool woodworking, you also want to embrace traditional hand tool finishes. One goes with the other. Again, I would argue if you're going to do this and go to all of this effort, you don't want it to look like flat pack factory made furniture. You want it to have that handmade charm, right? So I am evening, I am not doing the final cuts and like here there's a little bit of a, of a low spot. I will take the high spots down but I'm not going to gouge in I'm trying to get every last hollow out. A little bit more and then I'll show you one more thing about using this chisel. Okay. I like this little that little spot that's just going to stay there. Mm -hmm. That might end up on the finished piece. I'll kind of round off into it a little bit. But if that stays in the finished piece, I'm fine with it. Right? Your tool marks are part of it. 
Now, in here, you can see that, that made really quick work. From here up, I'm done. Mm -hmm. okay. But I still want to do a little bit more and get out some of the high spots down in this hollow. So now, instead of bevel up, I'm going to work bevel down. And I can now get into these hollows. If you don't have a big carver slick, just go to your hardware store and get the widest commercial chisel that you can find. You should be able to find a two, two and a half, sometimes even a three inch chisel, just with a regular intended to be hammered upon end quite readily at all but the smallest of hardware stores and give it a good sharpening and you can do this operation with that. Again, there's a difference between doing this for a living history museum and doing this in your backyard because you want to learn a skill. Don't feel, if you're doing this in your backyard, like you have to have 100% authentic tools to do it. Use the tools you have, get the tools you can get, and practice one thing at a time. Right, if you want to learn how to do burnout hollowing, okay, focus on that. Do the burnout hollowing traditionally. Walking around on me. Do the burnout hollowing traditionally and use your favorite tools that you already have or simple things that you can get anywhere to do the rest of the operations. And then if you get yourself a slick at a yard sale or an auction, um, or decide to forge yourself one, then design yourself a project where you're going to focus on learning how to use your slick. And for everything else, use whatever you're most comfortable with. So reduce the variables. Just learn one thing at a time. Okay? Um, don't, don't, don't be obsessive about having every part of the project absolutely authentic to a certain time period. Um, just focus on one skill at a time and learn and add that skill to your repertoire. And get the tools as they come. I'm about done this. Actually, I am done this. And that is that finished piece um, ready to dry. So again, there's the inside. There's the outside. We have a nice even curve all the way around. It's evener this way. And I'm just totally ignoring these handle ends until it's all the way dry. Now, I said I'm not worried about small checks, but at the same time, I don't want it to explode and break in half. So when I dry this, um, as soon as we turn off this camera, I'm going into the kitchen and I'm going to get myself a trash bag. And I'm going to wrap this in a trash bag and put it in a corner of the wood shop where it's not going to be in any drafts or in the house where it's not going to be in any drafts. Probably I'll put it in the wood shop for a month while it's still cool. And then when it bakes in there, I'll bring it into the house because it'll be a little cooler in the house after midday. Um, and I want this to take two or three or four months to dry. So I want this to dry as slow as humanly possible. I'm not going to bundle up and tie the, um, the, the trash bag, or it would not dry ever, right? I do want it to dry, but I want the, the dry, a, a lot of retardation on the drying process. I 
I'll slow it way down. So I will put it in the bag. I will fold the top over just with gravity and just kind of let it flop over and set that in a cool draft free corner of the wood shop. And in the fall, it will be time to see what worked, see what didn't, see whether see you know where the splits are, see what we have to work around. And then we will be in a place where we can level the top, level this, and design it into a finished piece of um, kitchen furniture. Mm -hmm. So this is something, you know, again, traditional skills take time. Working with wood takes time. Wood moves. Wood expands and contracts with humidity. You have to plan for that and accommodate that, and you can't rush it. You can't rush it. You have to go on its time frame. So, um, I hope that you have enjoyed this little three-part series on making this here bowl. I hope that you'll go give it a thumbs up. I, I think that's a bowl that deserves a thumbs up. So if you like it, go give it a thumbs up. And I will see you next time on the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel.